Welcome to the 11th installment of Textile of the Month Club, Textiles of Japan. Today we'll be talking about Kusakizome or natural dyes of Japan. The term Kusakizome, Kusa means herb or plant or grass, Aki means tree or shrub, and Some means to stain or to dye something. So combined, Kusakizome means natural dyeing. However, I should also point out um, that when the Japanese say kusakizome, it's not limited to just juice type dyes. It also includes pigments and other type of natural sources for colors. It's wonderful that nowadays there's a huge variety of books available in Japan for natural dyers. There are contemporary ones that are available at any bookstore in Japan. And then there are older limited editions. Um, if you've noticed my library in the back of me, most of those are limited editions from the 1970s. That seemed to be a heyday for producing all types of limited edition art books. But the nice thing about um, this particular type that you're seeing on the screen right now is that not only is the box it comes in beautifully hand dyed with katazome techniques, and in this case, indigo, but once you open it up inside, there are all sorts of samples of the actual dye uh, pieces themselves. And that's the type of thing I like to include in the books that I produce, or as part of this series, of course, to give you the actual samples to look at, to feel, to see what the color really is, as opposed to a synthetic reproduction of the natural color, or even further removed than a screen version. Now, the natural dyes themselves can be further divided into different categories, but one of the more interesting one to me is called kampo. Okay, kampozome, kampoyaku. Kampoyaku is um, Ayurvedic type uh, medicines. Most of the Ayurvedic medicines are referred to in Japanese as the useful dyes, dyes that have some um, use, affinity, help to mankind. So not only are they medicinal, most of those plants are also dye sources. In the case of this particular piece you're seeing here, this is an uh, ukon or turmeric dye, and turmeric is also considered an insect repellent. So very often you'll see beautiful kimono dyed in turmeric, this beautiful, we call it saffron yellow, but it's actually turmeric yellow. It protects the um, kimono itself from any in insect infestation, and therefore it's very useful. Now, you'll also see this exact same type of textile used in the Buddhist robes. So again, very often we refer to these as saffron robes, but they're not done with saffron. They're done with turmeric, which is one of the Ayurvedic medicines. All of the pieces that you see um, floating here are dyed with natural dyes. It's a beautiful array of colors. And this now gives you a sampling of some of the dye sources, whether it's indigo on the far left, you can see again on the far left, some uh, gardenia pods. Here we see indigo, the fresh leaves on the left. And here we see matter root, which is referred to as red root in Japanese. We have purple root or uh, shikon, murasakine in Japanese. Here we have safflower petals, which give this beautiful pink. And then just plain old straw called kariyasu gives a nice range of yellows depending on the mordant. So if we take that kariyasu, um, from the fields and go ahead and steep it in hot water to leach out all of the color, take it back down to room temperature, and then very slowly introduce, let me back up just a tiny bit here. I want you to see, pay attention to what he's doing. And this large pot of this room temperature dye with the mordant added, and he's very slowly dyeing this. It's a fairly weak dye. The quality of the color, the depth of color, the richness comes about not through cooking it at a hot temperature, but keeping the temperature very low, very warm to body temperature to your body, and then very slowly giving it time to stain. That means constantly circulating, stirring, getting all of the fiber surface exposed to the vat of dye over a long, slow, laborious process. This gives you absolutely the highest quality, even coverage of the dye 
in the fiber. You'll see a couple of examples of that coming up yet. Okay, and here again, you see gardenia pods here, uh, lots of different dyes that I'm sure you'll recognize back again to the alkanet, uh, or rather the matter root, excuse me. And on the left here, we have insects also, which are included. So when I mentioned that the, when we say natural dye, sakizome, we're not talking about just plants, not just shrubs and herbs. We're talking about pigments, as I mentioned. In this case, on the right, what we see is a branch with lac insects on it. Now, this lac incrustation here isn't actually the insect itself. It's an excrement that we take for the color. The insects are actually never damaged. And it's interesting, in Japan, they've done an incredible series of documentation over the last several decades of dye techniques around the world, in particular, Asia and Southeast Asia. There are videotapes of them actually hurting the lac. Okay, and what they do then is at the base of the Himalayas, they have this lac insect growing on the tree. They'll take that as the season change and take it up several thousand feet in the summertime to a cooler temperature, transfer it to a non-botanically related tree, so a different species. And then they leave the branch there for a couple of days to give the bugs time to crawl off this branch and into the new tree. Once that's done, they go back and harvest the branches with this lac uh, excrement on it, and they take that down and use it for the dye. Later, as the summer ends and it starts to get cooler, they go back up to that elevation, bring them back down to the warmer climate, and repeat this process. So they're actually hurting the lac, taking them from the lower elevation to the upper elevation, back and forth. And again, the insects are never harmed, which means they're not in danger of going extinct. They're not over farmed in that sense. This gives you a range of some of the beautiful colors from the dyes we just saw, dye sources we just saw. And now we're back to Benibana, okay? Benibana is this wonderful um, uh, safflower from which we take safflower oil and so forth. It also gives this absolutely incredible fluorescent flamingo pink. So the way this is done is by gathering up the petals when ready. There's a huge industry to harvest these things. They're soaked in water and steeped in hot water then. The steeping removes the yellow. Here you can see as they squeeze that all the yellow juice that's coming out. The yellow is not the color we're after. The yellow is a water-soluble dye that they're going to get rid of. Now you could save it and use it in its own right as a yellow dye. It functions as a yellow dye, but we're really after the pink. Okay, So once the water-soluble yellow has been removed, we'll go back and we will remove the non-water soluble by adding different um, chemicals and fermenting it partially to the petal to break it down and release the pink that we're after. And so here you see they're getting ready for that. They've removed all the yellow, they've pressed it to get rid of that, and now we're changing the pH to release the pink. For those of you familiar with fresh leaf indigo dye, you know we do the same thing. We take the dry indigo leaf cook it up to remove all of the yellow, get rid of that. So we're just left with the non-water soluble blue. And then we change the pH to remove the indican blue. They're doing pretty much the same thing with the safflower here. And now you can see that the pinker color, the oranger color, the redder color now is extracted. And as is true with many red dyes, such as cherry blossoms, sakura, and so forth, it helps to aerate it a little bit. That brings out the red in it. So they're steeping this in here now, soaking it, and it's a little bit saturated here. It's wet, so the color is a bit more intense than it will be when it's dry. It's actually less of an orange and much more of a pink, which you'll see in a moment. Okay, here you have a better example here. So imagine that dry. You know when fabric dries, it gets a little bit lighter. And so you can see there are different fibers in there taking the color a little bit differently, but still taking it beautifully nonetheless. Now, I want to show you one of the many ways that this benibana is used in dyeing. This is clamp resist called kyokechi or itajime. And you can see, I'm going to stop for just a moment. Notice this um, hemp pattern that's drawn on the top here. That's the pattern that's carved in the blocks themselves. And so when you carve down into the channel you see here that's red, that gives a moat in which the color travels to the core 
of this stack of blocks and allows the fabric to be dyed. Now, any part that's solid, such as the black part, pinches and prevents the dye from penetrating in that particular spot. So they're going to stack up as many layers as they like with the pristine white silk. And you can see the threaded rods here that they're then going to clamp down and really ratchet down the bolts there to get a nice, really tight pinch and keep any of the, pa the pattern from penetrating where we don't want the die to go. Okay, so you can see how much strength they're incorporating in that to get it really tight. Now, this is a fairly large piece in really more commercially oriented places that have a larger vat to dunk it, but it is a bit labor intensive to pick these blossoms. So in this case, they're being a bit more conservative and turning this block to allow the dye to flow into the channels. Now, once it's done so, as you can see here, here's the dye line that has dyed red or pink it actually. And you can see that that's the area down below here that has been carved. And as they open it up a bit more, you'll be able to see more of that. And so they have that set beautiful clear pattern. And that again is called itajime or kyokechi. Now, other ways, of course, you can absolutely dye the fabric solid. You can use um, kasuri techniques, any technique you like with any of the natural dyes. Now, on the left-hand side, what I'll ask you to take note of is the weave of the fabric. That's what we covered last week, the monro. Monro is the figurative lino weave, and that's what you're seeing in the pure white. If we move over, this more pinkish shade okay, is closer to the pure Benny Bana safflower color. In order to get the orange colors, the vermilion colors, you do an over dye with a yellow dye, like the Kadiyasu straw that we saw earlier. So the pink combined with the yellow gives this nice vermilion color. The Benny Bana by itself gives the nice pink color. Okay, the beautiful shades. And again, this is done the same way we saw with the Kadiyasu by putting the fabric in the dye bath and very, very slowly turning it so that all the fabric has even coverage. So let's go on now to Shikon or Murasakine. It's purple root, similar to Alkanet, and it's the root that we'll be using. So here they're pulling it out fresh, get all that dirt off, rinse it, and then the next step is to pulverize it to release all the dye that's within the root. And here he has it in a stone mortar. The pestle is wood. For those of you who like mochi, it's the same kind of uh, mochi usu that you might use. And as you start to dye it, notice what he's doing with the yarn. I'm going to stop for just a moment. What he's doing with the yarn is the same thing we were doing with the yardage. So by swishing it, by turning it on the rod and dipping it in, swishing, by turning it on the rod and swishing, getting very even coverage, but it's very time consuming, very, very labor intensive, but extremely high quality. Okay, and here you have a range of shades. Different shades, of course, are based on, are achieved by dipping longer, Dipping several times depends on the mordant used. There are many different factors that can alter the color, but they'll all be within the purple range. So here we have the very light lavender. If we go back and dip it again, here again, the yardage is being treated exactly as we saw it with the kariyasu. Again and again, pull it up. Okay, and then finally hanging it out to dry. And see what a beautiful intensive color that is. So again, brief review, those are all the beautiful colors. Let me back up just a tad. I went past that too quickly. Okay, so let's see if we can identify some of these colors. There are many things that produce yellow. Kariyasu would be one, the straw. Another one could be um, Yamamomo or Shibuki, which is a... Um, another type of tree dye, um, similar to barberry. We could use the yellow leftover from the safflower also if we chose to. Those would give nice yellows, all depending on the mordant. The pink here, I'm not quite seeing the pink from the safflower, but if you were to take that pink and over dye it with one of these yellows, you start to get the oranges and the vermilion colors. You can then 
over dye that further with alkanate if you choose to, or the alkanate by itself on the left. Um, go into the beautiful indigo blues that we have here. Black is usually achieved by layering several colors. Quite often indigo combined with, say, the um, barberry that I mentioned earlier, depending on the mordant. You see these various reds from the shkon or purple root, okay? And then in the back, of course, the greens and things are usually achieved by mixing the blues with the yellows, but there are many plants that will give green in and of itself, and just all the range. Now, the samples that are shown here are rather intensive and, and kind of zonker in nature. Not all natural dyes are that way. You can tone them down, you can mix them, you can gray them out. You can use dyes that don't give intense colors so that they have very soft variations on gray or slight blue, um, all sorts of things. The so Japanese are very fond of these off dull colors as well as the very bright ones. Okay. Now, the original video clip to that will be posted in the Japanese site that I took it off of, will be posted in the um, information below. So be sure and check that site out later. It has quite a bit more information. I think you'll enjoy watching. So going back to the pigment portion of it, this is a piece that my teacher dyed. Her name is uh, Hayashi Matsuo. This is a Bingata style piece, which is the type that I was uh, trained in. And you'll see a combination of many things. There's the plant indigo, of course, but there are also many pigments. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the pigments that we've used uh, in a close-up with this piece. Okay, so if we start out, we'll see that there is the cinnabar, and you may be more familiar with cinnabar as some of the Chinese beads and jewelry. Okay, there's certainly the malachite as well, which gives us the nice greens. Remember, those are pigments. Azurite is also a mineral pigment. Okay. And then there's cochineal. Cochineal may be used as a juice or as a pigment. When it's a pigment, it's a lake that's been created. And then, of course, indigo is always a pigment, unless it's fresh leaf, and you see the blues there. And then finally, orpiment is one more mineral. So within Okinawan dyeing, within Bingata, the majority of these colors are actually mineral-based. And the reason for that in Okinawan dyeing is that it's such a hot tropical country with such intense sunlight that they needed to develop a dye technique that um, didn't fade as quickly as vegetable dyes often will. And in turn, once they develop that to such a high degree so that it does not affect the fabric, it doesn't feel as if you have dirt stuck to it, it feels just like normal dyeing or just like juice dyeing, then that in turn was shared with the Japanese and the Japanese now often incorporate minerals applied directly as the Okinawans do. Most things are going to be mix and match of that. So the minerals basically just come from the earth. Now you can create a lake as we saw with the cochineal, where you cook the cochineal up, add mordants, add other chemicals to cause them to settle out or to flocculate. The sediment at the bottom becomes what's called a lake or a pigment. The top juice is disposed of because it's virtually clear at this point, all the colors in the bottom. Now, cochineal by itself needs to have a mordant added, applied to the silk, and usually heat set with steam. Once it becomes a pigment, a lake, it's no longer water soluble. And so putting it on the cloth, steaming, it's not going to do any good. It's going to fall off just like dirt would fall off. So it requires a binder, which is normally soy milk. Okay. And so if I were to go to the painted desert here in the States and collect any of these pigments, I would use them the same way I described the cochineal lake. I would take that pigment, grind it up, wash the dirt so that it's clean and has take only the finest particles and apply that to my fabric with the soy milk. And that's actually what I do most often in my own work. I know many of you have had classes with that too, so I know you're familiar with it. So here's a sampling of natural dirt pigments that occur around the world. Most of these also, fortunately, occur in Okinawa. Okinawa is a region that's really blessed with all sorts of pit mineral deposits, Very one of the richest places on earth. And this gives you, I think, an appreciation of what a broad range of mineral pigments, of dirts, uh, can be dug up and used with no further processing. Now, you can even get some variety out of that. If you take ochre, and you bake it in the oven, you get burnt umber. 
case, we have umber and burnt umber. You can do that with many minerals. A chemical change takes place, which alters the shade. We can scrape the top, top off an indigo vat, and that's now pure pigment, which we would also apply with soy milk. This gives you a range of the commercially available pigments in Japan that you can get at most art stores uh, and certainly at dye stores. Uh, these are also lakes as well as uh, mineral pigments. So what I normally do and what is done with Okinawan and many Japanese dyeing techniques is you take those pigments, as I mentioned, mix them with soy milk. That becomes a permanent dye on your fabric. When you wash away the paste resist that's used, you get beautifully patterned uh, textiles. So to produce the rice paste resist for the stenciling, typical of Okinawan work, you need to carve a stencil. So here you see the artist carving a stencil out of handmade mulberry paper. Once it's lacquered, a rice paste resist is being pushed through the stencil that adheres to the fabric, blocks that area, protects that area from receiving any color. Then with a series of brushes called surikomi brushes made from deer hair, the artist will go back and individually paint in these pigments, juice dyes, any dye that they choose to use, building up layers and colors to create depth, shade, movement, a syncopation of rhythms of all these colors working together, typical of Okinawan. And you wind up with this type of piece. Again, typically Okinawan bright colors most of which are pigments, but many of them are also juice dyes. This is an example of a kimono I did for a friend some 50 years ago. Um, the background gray purple, I'm not sure how it's appearing on your screen. It's actually a, a nice, what's called wisteria color in Japanese. It's a gray purple. This was made from ivy berries. So English ivy blooms in the spring. And then a little bit later in the summer, it gets these nice purple berries. And that's what I use for the background color. Um, there's some indigo here, a little bit of ochre, a little bit of barberry and a range of other colors. And the patterning was applied with the stencil and the rice paste resist as described just a moment ago. And this will now give you an idea of what the kimono looked like finished. It was a very delicate pattern, even though um, being got to style. And it was produced for Mrs. Kanematsu, you see here on the far left with her friend, Mrs. Sua. This is also a piece, this time a bit more zonker, again, one that I dyed. Um, these are all natural juice dyes and natural pigments. So I'm trying to show you that the juice dyes will give you these brilliant colors that we saw at the beginning, as well as the pigment dyes give you brilliant, brilliant colors. You can mix them, you can muddy them, or you can create very subtle soft tones by varying mordant, concentration, and the order in which you apply them. All of that range of color and nuances available to any dyer practicing these techniques. So there's another method of using the natural dyes to create the kind of patterning that you have in your sample this month. One is the rice paste that you saw. Another one is a more direct printing technique called sarasa. It's sort of the grandparent of silk screening. So rather than pushing rice paste through the paper, we're pushing color through. You can see the type of brush being used is called a peony brush, botanbake, and each natural dye one at a time is pushed through that stencil to build up the complicated patterning that you saw. There is another form of sarasa, this time not using a paper stencil, but instead using something to print with. You can print with a wooden block or vegetable as I'm doing here. So here you see me carving a potato to use as my printing tool, just using a, an X-Acto knife and a standard russet potato. Okay, so once the details are determined, I'm going to cut a different potato for each color. I'm going to stamp that against my cotton. The cotton's been prepared um, ahead of time with some soy milk. Push my brown in. It's a brown mineral that's been mixed with soy milk. Next comes my second color with a new potato to print with. Push that in there nicely. And when we pull it off, you'll start to see the pattern emerge. Okay, so this is going to be a series of little birds. Here you can see I'm well on the way to completing my pace, my piece at this stage. 
Okay, and this is the finished item. So all of these are natural dyes. Um, everything has been printed. The finer lines are painted in with a brush after the printing is completed. So let's go on to some of the Japanese bolts now from my collection. Um, what this says is that it's 100% natural dyes. This is what it's, it says here, okay? And in addition to that, it's Kusaki Zome. And the label gives you everything you need to know. Furthermore, it will also, in this section, which is a little bit hard to see on screen, tell you exactly what dyes were used. So sapin is one of the dyes, barberry is listed, hoji type of green tea is listed, and then it also tells us the dyer's name, Shimamura. And this gives you a little bit more detail of the colors used. No pigments in this case. And here's another one. This is uh, Nambu Murasaki. Nambu is a Nambu region in Japan. And this is using a plant similar to alkanet. Look at the beautiful work. And of course, this case, in this case, the resist is string. So it's a type of shibori dye. This use of this dye almost died out. Um, it fell into disuse. Um, it sort of fell by the wayside. And people started to forget about it until several regional researchers decided, hey, what happened to this? Went back, researched it, developed it, and really um, brought this back into the culture of Japan. It's very popular. It's fairly expensive, but very recognizable, very popular dye color. And of course, it's exquisite purple. This gives you another variation of it, this time not shibori dyeing, but instead the rice paste resist, as we saw earlier, with the colors brushed on and cochineal and indigo and a few other colors added to uh, augment it. Okay. This again tells you this within this bolt. One of the nice things about the bolts in Japan, because the Japanese value this information and Kusakizome in particular is, is highly regarded in Japan, in more modern times, they've started listing the dice as you saw a moment ago. So what this says at the top here is it says uh, Nippon no Iro, so colors of Japan or Japanese color. And then it tells us right here that it's purple root um, color dyeing. Okay. And then it'll have the company stamp down in the corner there. These are the things I'm looking for. I have lots of bolts. You'll have access to lots of bolts that don't necessarily have the provenance listed. That doesn't mean they're not natural dyes, and it certainly does not mean that they're anything other than exquisite quality. However, from a teaching standpoint and from a collector standpoint, and because I want to share these with you, I want to be sure of what I'm presenting. And the best way to be sure is to have the label attached, okay? And so that's why I'm focusing on that here. If you come across some that are exquisite, that don't have the label, never included, or in some cases cut off already, don't worry about it. They're still good quality, okay? So this particular sample over here tells us that it's Kusaki Zome. It goes on, along to give the other kind of information I've told you. Basic natural dyes employed. This is a listing below. So uh, Gibracho with chrome is one of the dyes, okay? Sapin with chrome is listed. Lac with iron and Kutch with iron, okay? Those are the different dyes that were used in creating this particular piece. Uh, it's a wax resist, by the way. And this gives you a detail of the label that we saw just a moment ago. So again, it says Kusaki Zome here. Um, it's telling you that this is the Kusaki Senshoku Bijitsu Kenkyu Kai, okay? Which is the natural dye, um, uh, beautiful color, <laughs> okay? Um, research, um, Bijitsu is, is um, artwork. Kenkyu is research. So this is the... Beauty of Natural Dyes Research Center's production produced piece. Okay. And then it goes on down below to tell you that pigment, the colors that were used with it, um, that they are the traditional techniques used since ancient times. Okay. So all that on this label, and of course, there's there are the specific dyes listed as well. And this gives you a detail of the patterning itself. Again, it's wax resist. Roketsu is what it's called in Japanese. Okay, now this is getting closer to the type 
that you see within the sample uh, for this month. It's the same patterning, just a different colorway than the one that's in the sample. And what this tells you is that there, these are the ancient techniques, okay? And then it also tells you that up here, that Gambian acacia is one of the dyes, mulberry with chrome is used, grape, and then sapin with chrome is used. And again, it says real, okay, hong, so real, true, um, not imitation, natural dyes. You can see in the bleeding here the, how the different, there are several layers of color also. So this also says, uh, this is tesuri, so it's authentic brush dye. That means they're probably using the technique that we saw earlier with the multiple stencils for color. So you can see there is rice paste resist used through a stencil. And then once the, stent, the rice paste was applied, they either went back and painted the colors by hand or by hand in combination with that silkscreen-like technique. But even when it's silkscreen, there's a difference between pushing it through with a squeegee and rubbing it through with the brush. The brush is considered higher quality, and that's what this label says that it is. Okay, now this is yet another one. This tells us that it's birch, um, several layers of natural dyeing. I'm just trying to show you a range of what labels might look like. And here again, this talks about this is top quality Japanese dye work. Um, it's being done with birch. Um, it's going to be, well, it goes on just giving you the history of it. Now, getting on again to our sample, different colorway. This is a little white section of undyed part of the fabric. There is a stamp here that says kusakizome. And then there's the, the chop, the ink of the dyer themselves for authenticity. Okay, and then finally, we'll get to our sample of this month. So this is the same pattern as the one we just saw. It's from the same dyer, the same producer, had the same label. It's just a different colorway of the same thing. And so once more, you can see that there are the very fine lines that come from the rice paste resist, and then all the different shadings of colors that are in there geared to be very understated, very soft, very muted, as opposed to the more zonker colors that we saw earlier. That pretty much concludes it for our talk today. What I'll do now is go ahead and sign off with this portion for the YouTube upload, and then we can go ahead and continue on with our question and answers. So if you'll go ahead as a group and turn back on your screens and your volume, we'll go ahead and get started.